can, a species that we need to get concerned about. The idea is by doing that, we can then pay attention to it through research at universities or through conservation agencies uh, to help it not become that threatened or endangered. Uh, and then of course we know what the, the end game of that is. So um, we've had examples of wonderful recoveries, the bald eagle being one of the best ones uh, that became endangered and is now uh, in nesting in every state in the, in the United States except Hawaii. Um, and uh, even in my home state of Iowa, it nests along little muddy creeks uh, in the uh, cottonwood trees. It's pretty amazing to see that. When I was 17 years old and did a report on DDT and, and uh, uh, the bald eagle, I figured I'd never ever see one as an adult and now I can see them readily. All of this is done uh, as a base uh, because of what's known as the Texas Conservation Action, Action Plan or TCAP. And basically what that is, is a plan every state has to have uh, they name it however they name it, but they have to have that to be able to work on those SGCNs for federal funding. Um, and so our last one was 2012. It's in the process of being updated now and hopefully will be released about 2022. So just to kind of give you a, an introduction to the Texas Nature Trackers program, uh, we are a small, but what I'd like to say is a mighty program. I want to show you our website very quickly. When you go to a link, uh, go to our website, there's the link for it down here at the bottom. You're going to find three tabs that you can click on. Uh, the first tab is going to be projects. Those are the individual projects that we have created and or are partnering on. Uh, target species are the species we've selected from the SGCN list that we need community science help with. Um, uh, documenting. And then the last link is getting involved. And that's, that takes you to links for the City Nature Challenge, for iNaturalist, and other uh, activities. So first of all, the projects. We have 12 projects that we manage or assist with. Um, the long, one of the longest running ones is the Herps of Texas and the Whooper, uh, Texas Whooper Watch. Um, they've been around a long time. It used to be paper sampling, uh, uh, and we have all kinds of boxes of paper now. Everything now is online and works really, really, really well. A couple of them that are related to plants that might particularly interest you is our Texas Milkweeds for Monarchs. That is a project that is trying to document all um, Asclepias milkweeds across the state of Texas. Uh, it's, a very, it's been a very popular program. We've got lots of observations. The idea is to get a good database about where every species of milkweed is in the state of Texas. That will help us uh, when it comes to planning for how are we going to take care of monarch butterflies as they move through uh, the state north and south each uh, spring and fall. Another project is our Rare Plants of Texas project. This is a pretty highly focused program uh, that is documenting those rare plants in Texas. I know down there in the Houston area, we got Katy Prairie and, and lots of other amazing uh, wetland uh, communities. Uh, you probably have some native plants that are pretty rare down there. And so this is a project that tries to document those really rare plants of the state. Now, uh, in terms of target species, that was the second link on the web page. You can actually search by different taxa groups to find out what plants uh, or herps or birds or mammals are or inverts um, are being targeted in Texas. You can do that by taxa group. So if you select plants, this is the beginning of the list of the plants that we're tracking uh, in here in Texas um, that are uh, that are particularly of interest that are also accessible to the general public for the most part. And then you could also select uh, uh, eco region and then take a look at what those are and, and nail that down as well. And you can see there are a lot of milkweeds on this list. Not all of them are rare or threatened or endangered, but again, one of the things, the, the advantages of this is if we can build up a good database, a good baseline, if things happen and if certain species become increasingly rare, we have a historical record of where we found those in the past so we can address that going forward. So the third tab on our webpage is get involved. And of course, iNaturalist is the way that uh, we uh, market getting people involved across our state. And iNaturalist, which was developed by graduate students, believe it or not, in California, uh, it's now a global app and a global phenomenon, really. iNaturalist is an online social network of people sharing biodiversity information to help each other learn about nature. That really is what it is. And it's a wonderful group of people, by the way. 
Uh, two primary, primary goals of iNaturalist to connect, to connect people to nature and then to generate that valuable data from the people using the app when they're out in nature. Um, so it's doing two things. It's getting people outdoors and it's also then taking them, their technology that they carry with them, we carry with us 24 seven, it seems like, and actually taking advantage of the fact that they're taking pictures of plants and animals. The basics of how it works are you download the app and we'll, we'll go through the app with you this evening. Um, you download the app to your phone. You go out and you take a picture of a, a caterpillar or a butterfly or a tree or a wildflower. You share that on iNaturalist. The community helps you to do the identification of it if you don't know what it is. That's the another great thing about the app. Um, it, it doesn't require you to know what you're taking a picture of. It's there to help you with that process and they can identify it and you can move on to your next observation. So you're, again, there's that learning part. Um, it's like, again, having an encyclopedia with lots and lots of images and uh, observations and lots of people to help you. So globally, iNaturalist, as of a couple of days ago, had over 61 million observations across the world. In North America, almost 40 million observations. And then if we come to Texas, over 4 million observations. So Texans use this a lot. It's amazing how this has grown. We are 6.9% roughly of the global observations are logged in Texas. And in, uh, in North America, we're over 10% of that. Um, so we use it a lot down here. And as a result of that, Texas Parks and Wildlife would have been nuts not to take advantage of what was going on with this app. So let's talk, before we get into the app and all of that, let's talk about the City Nature Challenge. So just so that you know a little history about it, for those of you that don't know much about it, um, it was initiated in 2016 as a friendly competition between San Francisco and LA, out where it was developed. It's now an inter international event with more than 200 cities across the globe. We're lucky because the timing of it is, is our spring. If you're in other parts of the world, it's their winter, so it's not quite as good for them. But we have a lot of cities that um, gather people to have this bit of fun for this four-day period. It's organized by the California Academy of Sciences and the Natural History, uh, Natural History Museum of LA County. Um, as with last year, this year's event will focus on the healing power of nature, this is their words, and celebrate tens of thousands across the globe searching for and documenting local biodiversity. Normally, this is a friendly competition. In Texas, even with the pandemic, all the cities have decided to make it a friendly competition because they were in Texas and we're competitive, aren't we? Um, so we will be trying to figure out, beat each other in terms of numbers of people, numbers of observations, numbers of species. It consists of four days of documenting um, using your app and then followed by six days of identifying observations. And that's really, really important because from the conservation standpoint, the more of those observations we get to what is known as research grade, the better off we will be in terms of being able to use that data for conservation. During 2020, when the pandemic hit, we thought that this would drop way off. And what we actually found globally is that uh, there were 815,000 observations made by of 32,000 species by more than 41,000 people. So people still, they got out in their backyard, they got off their deck, they went to their local park when they took it to, walk, to go walk the dog, took a few pictures. So people still wanted to get out. And the really interesting, one of the interesting side effects, positive side effects of, 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 of the pandemic has been that a lot of people rediscovered the nature in their backyard. Um, if you talk to bird feed stores, some of those places have, have seen a surge of business as more people realized, I've got birds in my backyard, let's get some food for them. Um, I've got hummingbirds, let's put up a hummingbird feeder. Um, those kinds of things, people rediscovered the nature immediately around them. So make plans participate. Uh, this is your second plug for it. Um, again, eight, Friday, April 30th through Monday, May 3rd. And then you had the identification period is the fourth through the ninth. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and this year we have, we've kind of blown the doors wide open for city nature challenge across the state of Texas. Last year we've had, we had five cities or seven cities. I think the year before that, maybe five or six. We are now up to 13 plus Mustang Island. 
Uh, you can see all the different locations around the state, including you all in the Houston area. Um, but it's, it's, it's amazing how many people, 78 counties, 30% about of um, Texas counties are participating and a whole lot of potential participants in each one of these metro areas. So we're very excited to see the expansion of this event because not only does that mean more people participating in exploring nature, it also means more potential good data that we are gathering. So here's your banner right here. Uh, it's already up, it's ready to go. And once it starts in a uh, little less than 14 days, um, or about 14 days, uh, you'll be able to go in here and log and see what's going on uh, each of those days uh, through the process. So just to kind of show you how it affected, how it impacted Texan, Texans and, and the state of Texas, um, we actually thought we were gonna have a decline in observers and, and documented records, but in 2020, during the pandemic, it actually increased statewide by 30% compared to the previous year. Um, one of the things we're learning about City Nature Challenge is when people go through it and participate, it, it actually leads many people to become deeper uh, users of iNaturalist um, and they use it for longer periods of time. So we're actually creating a sustained engagement of more and more people each year with the event. Um, iNaturalist user activity shows pattern of increased engagement more observations and identifications. And that pattern continues well beyond those four days. We even have people get to a point where they're actually teaching iNaturalist workshops themselves. So there is a lot of civic engagement and it grows with a lot of people. Some other results, 56%, more than half of our observations in the, uh, all of the project cities uh, were made what is called research grade. That means those are data that are of high enough quality that can be used in the natural diversity database. So very, very valuable data is found through this effort. Um, specifically, we had over 1,700 research grade observations of 123 SGCN. So again, those records are valuable. If we didn't have this event, if we didn't have iNaturalist, this data would not be getting collected at the rate that it is now. So incredibly important, incredibly valuable. So some discovery, we do make occasional discoveries. This was made by a young uh, a kid, found this plant that hadn't been found in, in uh, Dallas County or in that part of the state for a long time, a new population uh, in Dallas County. This was from 2019. So you never know what's gonna be discovered uh, for, uh, with these efforts that are out there. And the other thing it does is iNaturalist through the City Nature Challenge, it magnifies the effort and the impact that a biologist, a, a paid wildlife biologist can have. You can see here in the Houston area, Houston Galveston area, 84 community scientists to every one TPWD biologist. So you can see really magnifies the impact of gathering information that a lone biologist simply does not have the capacity to do. In addition, what we find out is that iNaturalist, people documenting things, it provides records that even city and county officials that manage parks don't know what's going on out there. So, but what, when they find that out, they find out, hey, this is a really important natural area, more important than we thought it was. It can help with land acquisition, recreation or restoration projects and habitat management efforts. So really, really valuable stuff. So just a really quick overview of the web page before we get to the app itself. Uh, first of all, when you go and log into iNaturalist on your computer, this is what your screen is going to look like. Obviously, it'll be your name, not mine. Um, and there are lots and lots of links to check, click on here. We don't have time to go through an entire everything that's on this web page because this is really where the meat and potatoes of iNaturalist are, is the website. Um, I do trainings. Uh, Tanya and I both do trainings all around the state. Right now, they're all virtual, but we travel also. Um, so down the road, if you want to have a full-blown workshop, it can be two hours, three hours, four hours, whatever you want. Uh, we can provide much more detailed information in a training workshop for you. But very briefly, up here are the community drop-downs right here. So you can go to your observations, actually links right here. Um, you can go to community. You can look for other iNaturalist users. Uh, you can identify other people's observations through this, this drop down here. And on this one right here, you'll find the help information. 
you will find uh, how to create a project, how to create a place, all of those things. For your own, for your own page, the different uh, links that you have here, the different tabs, you have your profile page, you have observations where you can go in and actually edit those observations anytime. You can help with IDs. You, that, this will give you the list of the things you've helped ID. You can identify new things by clicking on this link up here. And then there's the project page. And project, what projects are, are designed, um, organized, um, locational, uh, location chosen places where we're trying to collect information. And just to kind of give you a kind of run through of some of the different kinds of collection pro projects, we can have projects that are statewide. This is called the Texas Pollinator BioBlitz. It's an event that runs for about three weeks each August or each October. It's put on through Texas Parks and Wildlife, and, and we get lots of people observing. This one focuses on um, pollinators and the flowers that they feed on, and we get a lot of positive um, documentation here and a lot of participation. This is a growing event. We, can, we, we think it'll continue to grow and get larger and larger. Bio blitzes are another way to gather information. A bio blitz is basically a concentrated effort by a large number of people to go into a specific area a, for a specific duration of time and try to document everything that's there. So essentially what you end up with is a snapshot of everything that's blooming, all the birds, all the mammals, everything that you can document in that time frame. And people do it seasonally, they do it quarterly, they do it once a year, uh, but it's, a, it's kind of a community effort to try to document the natural world to give us a better understanding of what's out there. You also can have taxes specific um, um, collection projects. So for example, um, this is a project that we started when I worked at Guadalupe River State Park. We've been surveying butterflies for years and years um, with papers and binoculars. Um, we started this iNaturalist project because not only could we upload images that we took, but other visitors to the park that took a picture of a butterfly in iNaturalist could then also take a, uh, add to this collection, uh, this project as well to get a better understanding of butterflies over time. You can even do property-based observation projects. So it could be, um, it could be a Katy Prairie, or it could be your own um, backyard or your own ranch. You can set up your own project. This happens to be mine that's in my yard. Um, and uh, I do a lot of native plant restoration in my yard. So I document when those species begin to flower each year. And then all of the pollinators and other, the birds and everything else that comes to the yard as a result of those restoration efforts. So that's a great way for me to track phenology of blooming times, of arrival times of insects and birds and the like each year. And I have a 0.22 acre yard, by the way. So I've got a lot going on in that little tiny yard. Um, so tips for using the app. So the app, when you open up the app, you download it, you create an account. It's free to do. You just need a, a username, your email address, create a password, tell them you're not a, a, a robot and you are up and running. When you open it up on the iPhone on the left, this is what it's going to look like. On the right, uh, on the um, uh, Android, this is what you're going to see. If you want to take an image, and I know I'm talking pretty fast here because we're trying to cover a whole lot of ground. Um, but if you want to take an image on the iPhone, you're going to click on this right here, this little camera that says observe. On the Android, you're going to click on this green circle with a plus sign. We just had a new update to the app on the iPhone. So I want to go over that with you. This literally happened about uh, within the last week. When you open up that, when you click on that camera symbol or that plus sign, you're going to get four choices right here. You're going to have the, uh, you can use your camera roll. So that would be pictures that are already on your camera. You can record sound now before you couldn't record sound with the app. You could actually do an observation that you didn't get a photo of. So if a flock of whooping cranes flies over and you couldn't get a picture of them, but you know they were whooping cranes, you can make a documented record of that. Um, and then of course you can use the iPhone or the, um, uh, the phone on the iNaturalist app. Now that leads to a question. So you have two choices of, you got, actually got three uh, choices with photography. You can use a camera. You have to upload those images through the website. You can use your camera on your cell phone. And what that does is gives you the opportunity 
to edit your photograph before putting it on iNaturalist. So if it's a small object, you need to edit it and magnify it. You can do that, crop it so that it's easier for iNaturalist and other people on iNaturalist to help identify. You cannot do that by taking a picture of the using the iNaturalist phone. You can't edit the picture there. So keep that in mind. So you have to make a choice um, whether you're going to use the iNaturalist phone or your camera phone. Either way works. You can access those photos easily from iNaturalist and upload them directly from there. So to show you that, if we choose camera roll, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this. It's going to open up my um, photos. And then I can click on a photo right here. You can see I clicked on it. Uh, there's that little check mark. I can click on add, and that's going to add it into the observation. I can then go through the process that I'm going to show you here in a moment for regular photography and share my observation. So that's a way you can use photographs from your albums, basically your phone albums, to upload those images. And again, the advantage of that is you can edit that before you put it on iNaturalist. So now let's say we're gonna record sound. This is brand new on the iPhone, so this is awesome. So basically what you do, if you click on that, you're gonna get a screen that looks like this. If you click on that little uh, microphone right there, it's gonna start recording. You can you know, see how long it's recording right there. It's a bird, a, a frog, a toad, a Katie did. Um, and then when you're done, you can click on this again, and then you can save the recording. When you do that, it's going to lead over here. And now you'll notice up here, instead of a photograph, it is the actual recording right there. What this doesn't do is identify the recording for you. So when you click on what did you see, notice it doesn't say what did you hear, what did you see? I guess they should add, they should change that to update it. But instead of it providing you suggestions, you're going to have to type in something here. OK, so when you click on that, it leads to this screen. If you know what it was, a cardinal, for example, you can type in northern cardinal and then it will populate that as your choice. If you don't know what it is, you could just say bird and then it'll it'll provide a placeholder called bird. And when you upload it to iNaturalist, people that know bird songs may be looking for that and may help you identify that song. So that's a way to put a placeholder when you don't exactly know what it is when it is a sound recording. And then here's what it's gonna look like on your iNaturalist phone or app. These are the photographs, obviously. These are the sound recordings. So a little different symbol right there. All right, well, let's go back to iNaturalist. We're just gonna use iNaturalist. We're gonna click on the camera. We're gonna use the iNaturalist camera. So we click on this right here. We have our image. We take a picture of this right here. You'll notice it's here and here. You'll also notice there's a box with a plus sign. What this allows you to do is if you want another photograph, and when it comes to plants, more than one photograph is often helpful. The lobelia that you uh, showed right there, having multiple photographs, one of the entire plant, one of the flower, a close-up of the flower, the leaves, the, the, the seed pods, all of that helps with the identification. So if you want more pictures, you just click on this, it takes you right back to the camera, take another picture, then you can take another picture, another picture. It keeps providing you that opportunity. After you've got the pictures you want, you're gonna click on what did you see on either one of the phones. What it's gonna do is it's gonna provide you choices, okay? Most of the time. Notice this one is the genus Oaks. This, and then below that, it gives you specific choices, specific species. If you know what it is, you can go ahead and pick the species that it is. If you don't or aren't sure what it is, you can just go ahead and leave it as oaks and use that as the placeholder. And so when you upload it, somebody will see that and hopefully look at your photographs and say, hey, oh, by the way, this is a, a, a Texas live oak. And then you can agree or disagree with them. And then you're, if you agree with it, and uh, it, become, it then can become a research grade observation. So I select, I selected as Texas Live Oak because I knew that. Now, a few other things noted is always going to have a date and a time. It's also going to have location data. And accuracy is really, really important. Um, for us in our projects, we want it less than 500 meters, but you can always click on those and you pulls up a map. You can move the map around either side, either satellite or regular map and pinpoint the location better. Save it up here or hit the check mark right there and that'll give you a better um, uh, accuracy. 
Then you can also choose whether you want to share the location data with everyone or you want to hide it. And if you click on geo privacy or location visibility, the default is open. That means everybody can see the coordinates. But you can also check obscured or private. Obscured puts a big box around it with a random dot. Private completely hides the, obs the observation from the map. And that's really valuable, especially if it's a rare plant and you want to get it to the right people, but you don't want to necessarily tell everybody where the exact location of that plant is. And then, of course, you have to decide whether it's captive or cultivated with plants. If it's something you planted in your yard, that's going to be cultivated, even if it's a native plant. But let's say you plant a native plant and 10 years ago, 10 years from now, you look and it's spread all the way across the countryside uh, in your yard. Those then become probably wild plants. That's a decision you can make. And then finally, there are projects, all these projects you join. There are two different kinds of projects. There's these collection projects where you say you take this right here and I wanted to add it to one of these projects. I would have to click the tab right here and flip it over to green to make it join. These projects are known as umbrella or collection projects. I don't have to do anything. I don't even have to join them if I don't want to. It's going to grab that image if it's within its geographic area and pull it into the project automatically. So then all you do is you share your, your observation and you're good to go. Now, something that's critical, you got to remember, um, iNaturalist is not always correct. Right here is an example. This was three black vultures. The choices were black bear, crow, boar, American bison, my favorite, and common raven. Clearly, iNaturalist is not correct 100% of the time. And the bear definitely disagrees. So keep that in mind. It's great but it's not perfect. It never probably will be perfect. And even if you get the perfect picture of something, it doesn't mean that it's gonna be able to identify it to species. All right, some photography tips. And I wanted to share this with you, especially when it comes to plants. Um, this little device is called a Zenvo. It has a 15 power macro lens on it that you can attach to your cell phone. It takes spectacular close-up pictures, especially of plants and insects. I would encourage you to look into that because it really does provide quality images, especially with small wildflowers and small insects. You can also, you don't have to buy a camera with a two foot long lens that costs thousands of dollars. This is a camera that we were issued at work um, and it works really good for taking photographs of a lot of different things at different ranges. So when you photograph wildflowers, get as good a picture as you can in the flower. If you need to crop it, crop it to get it closer. Take a picture of the side of the flower with the sepals and with the hairs on the stems, just like you saw in the Lobelia example. Uh, take a picture that has the leaves to show the arrangement of the leaves, what the stem looks like. Take a look at the entire, uh, get a photograph of the entire um, um, uh, plant as well if you can. With woody plants, knowing that if the leaves are alternate or opposite, whether it's a compound leaf or a simple leaf, sometimes the back of the leaf has better pictures of the veins uh, or image or a view of the veins than the top of the leaf. If you have tendrils or prickles or fruits or flowers or, or bark, take a picture of those things. All of those aid in identification. And just because you're looking at plants, you're going to see insects. So you can chase down insects, be persistent, observe them. And sometimes you can get pretty close, uh, whether it's a butterfly or a moth or a dragonfly or a damselfly, um, a, a honeybee or a bumblebee um, or a spider even. Now, a few other things. If you run into an image where you uh, have multiple species, go ahead and crop those on your computer. And that way you get two observations, one of the Ross's goose on the right and one of the snow goose on the left. Remember that animal tracks, roadkill counts. Believe it or not, there are roadkill projects out there. So what more can you do? You can help ID. And this is, you all are NIPSOT members, so you probably have varying degrees of expertise in native plants. Dig out your field guides. Uh, this is the tip of the iceberg on mine, of mine. But dig those out, sit down some evening, go to iNaturalist, select, identify. You'll get these screens up here. You can sort by taxa groups. You can sort by Texas or North America or the globe, whatever you want, wherever you feel your strengths are. And then you can help people get their observations to research grade, just like other people help get you get your observations to research grade. So why help with IDs? Um, really, really valuable. 
Other people are interested in nature, help them get, keep their interest in nature by helping them get positive identifications. Moves things to research grade, gives you another way to contribute to possible conservation efforts, gives you the opportunity to sharpen your naturalist skills. And I always say, why not? Why wouldn't you do that? It's a lot of fun, actually. Why this matters to Texas Parks and Wildlife. First of all, here's an example of one of our projects, Herps of Texas. We have added close to 5,000 good records of SGCNs to the Texas Natural Diversity Database because of citizen scientists. Without this app and without the involvement of citizen scientists, that number would be very much smaller. Here's an example of a specific species that uh, typical research was done where they put out traps and uh, cameras trying to document the Eastern spotted skunk. Over 8,000 device nights, they got 12 detections in four counties out of 10. They at the same time went out to the public and said, help us out. They ended up with more records than they otherwise would have got in more counties than they were able to, to sample, including brand new records in six counties. So again, community science is powerful when it's used for conservation. A week ago, I was watching this, the Texas Parks and Wildlife a commission meeting and a biologist came on, was talking about squirrel hunting proposed changes. These two maps are the iNaturalist records for gray and fox squirrels. By using those maps, it gave them additional data from two very common animals um, coming off of iNaturalist. So iNaturalist is actually being used in actual on the ground conservation planning. And then we all know Project a Winter Storm Uri hit. Um, recently, we created a project right after it and asked people to upload images of the wildlife that they found dead. We got over 3,000 observations. We just completed a three hour uh, report webinar for Texas Master Naturalists on Tuesday, and we're able to document all the things that happened as a result of that dangerous and deadly storm. So, iNaturalist across the country, just to show you that other people are using it. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is using citizen scientists and iNaturalist. Oregon is using them. Colorado is using it. California, uh, Florida, Massachusetts, lots of states are getting out there and actually using iNaturalist to help, just like Texas is, for conservation purposes. So you have a very powerful role you can play. So basically, in conclusion, go ahead and get out there and begin documenting for conservation. Again, this was a very, very quick overview of iNaturalist, the power of it. Um, again, if you want to do a workshop, I know there are people in Houston that do workshops, uh, but we can also offer a workshop for you down the road, hopefully one of these days in person. Here are links to the City Nature Challenge websites that you can check out. Uh, and finally, uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them if there's time. Here is my iNaturalist uh, um, name. Here's Tanya's. Here's my email here and Tanya's as well. If you have questions, please feel free to reach out to us anytime. All right. That is it. So I'm going to stop sharing now. And uh, I'll turn my camera back on momentarily here. And I would be happy to answer any questions you have. Again, I hope this was worthwhile. It was very quick, a lot of information there, and hopefully it will, uh, as enough to say uh, to those of you that have never used it or have used it very little, hopefully it stimulates you to get out there and uh, have some fun with it, learn about the nature around you, and at the same time contribute to conservation in Texas. So there you go. So I will leave it up to y'all as to where you want to take this next. Lan is asking a question if you, I'm, I'm looking at the chat, um, at some Zoom workshops in the near future before CNC. I, we're doing a couple of them. I can, Lan, I will send you a link to one I'm doing next Thursday night. It's only an hour presentation, full blown workshops. I don't have any between now and then, um, uh, but, um, uh, and I'll have to check with Tanya to see if she has any full-blown workshops. This year's kind of weird because we're still in this COVID thing. Um, so we haven't been doing as many of the full-blown workshops. But again, uh, we would be happy to set you up 
And again, you can use iNaturalist year round, so it doesn't only have to be before CNC. Uh, keep that in mind. What kind of camera do I use? So I, I for work, I use that, that Nikon um, uh, P900 or whatever it is. Uh, for my own personal work, I do. I use a a a, 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 a little Nikon D3100 or something like that with a macro lens. Oh, good question, Christine. She's asking about the does the photographer still own copyright? You have the choice in your settings to determine if you want all copyright um, permissions so that nobody can use your photograph, or you can say some people can use them, but with photo credit, you have choices. That is found on your profile uh, page and you can click on different choices for that. So that's absolutely um, doable. Um, can you show the iPhone attachment and the camera? Again, I was unable to get a photo of your recommendation. Oh yes, let me go ahead and share my screen real quick if that's okay. Um, let me pull up the presentation one more time. And this one right here. I just got done with another presentation. So I'm trying to make sure I grab the right, uh, the uh, right from the beginning right there. And on my share screen, where's my share screen here? I don't know what y'all are seeing. Let me get out of that. Let me try this again. I'm going to go ahead and share screen two. And then I'm going to open that presentation up again. And let me go to that in exact image. There you go right there from the current slide. Hopefully you can see that. Let me know if you can see that. This is the Zenvo right here that uh, I've attached to my phone. I only learned about this about two months ago and it has been spectacular uh, that I use it all the time now. And in terms of the work camera that I, I utilize, it's this one right here, which is a Coolpix P900. It has a huge zoom on it. So I can take pictures of birds from 100 yards away, edit them and they turn out marvelous. Um, and I can do macro photography if I want to with that camera. So it's wide ranging. I think the cost of that is somewhere around five to $600. So it won't necessarily break the bank. Hopefully that uh, uh, answers that question for you. Let me look on chat and see if there's anything more uh let's see here i can find chat there we go right there pop that up somewhere somewhere's chat where did chat go i don't know where it's disappeared to here so anyway that's that let me uh stop sharing once again there we go oh, there's chat okay all right, let's see, where is this presentation available? I would, I, I hope that somebody recorded it. If not, I don't know what to tell you there. Um, how do you set the coordinates for Android? So in terms of when you take a picture with your Android, when you go down and you look at the location data, um, you just click on that and you'll see that map pop up and you can pinch the map, you can move the map around, put that rec recording right in the middle of the, of the um, bullseye and then save it and it'll it'll adjust it there. Let's see the next to last slide with the resources. Um, yeah, you can uh, you can absolutely upload that uh, presentation. Um, are you tracking? Yes, absolutely. We're tracking native and non native invasive species. There are projects out there. We're not doing it necessarily, but certainly conservation is interested, especially in the spread of, of non native invasive species because it seems as though we continue to discover them. Let's see, let me go back into share screen one more time. And let me see if I can get through to that second to last slide here. Um, let's see here. Oh, let's see, I don't know which slide, let's see what slide, um, the next to last slide with the resources. Oh, right there. Is that the one you're looking for? Um, do we have to do anything to join? No, you do not. Actually, you don't have to uh, join this nature challenge. If you're within that multi-county area, it will actually um, upload your image automatically into the city nature challenge for the Houston uh, Galveston area. Question is, how do you create a project boundary like a park or a backyard? That is a whole nother matter. Um, Lucy, if you will email me that question, 
I would be happy to, to explain that to you either over the phone or through a Zoom or whatever. I can actually walk you through that process, okay? The first thing I will tell you to create a project or a place boundary, you have to have 50 verifiable observations first, okay? So make sure you have that before you can even create that project or place. Let's see here. Uh, I think that looks like that's about it. I don't see any other questions coming in. Lan, are we done? Yes, thank you so much. That was really great. Very interesting, very informative. Good. Very good. Oh, wait a minute. I'm just, somebody says, please answer Nancy's question. I did answer Nancy's question. Are you tracking non-native non invasive species? Yes, we are. We aren't specifically through the Texas Nature Trackers program, but there are other projects out there tracking invasives, non-natives, uh, because they're interested in that. And of course, the botanists, and there may be other people within the state doing that that I'm just not aware of. But specifically, our program is not doing that. Um, let's see here. Um, I live in Burton, not in Houston area, which city? So um, I do I'll have to, I apologize, Kathy. I do not know where Burton is. Um, if you go to, let me back up a slide or two here. If I can find it, I'm hoping I can find it. Let's see here. I'd like to be able to find it. Let's see here. You're not sure. If you go to... Oh, I'm not sharing right now. It's not working. Oh, that's because I didn't turn it back on. Yeah. Good night, nurse. There you go. How's that? Uh, oh, by the way, thanks for pointing that out. There's always two buttons you got to hit on Zoom, I guess. So there's my contact information. I don't know if that's what people were looking for. Uh, but if you go to iNaturalist, just type in a search for iNaturalist or City Nature Challenge, you can actually find the, the counties that were within each metropolitan area. Um, and uh, then you'll know which, which uh, uh, city is participating. But even if you live outside of all of those areas, you can still participate in the global project that will take you. So uh, you, you, nobody is left out this year for the first time. All right, Washington County is not in okay to go with the global. There you go, that's exactly what you'll have to do. Jaime Gonzalez, you betcha, has posted a video about creating a project with a boundary file, very good. Jaime uh, is wonderful with iNaturalist and he's a big a big uh, iNat user in, in your area. So um, uh, take advantage of him when you can. He's an awesome guy doing a lot of awesome work in, in your area. All right, well, I don't see anything else coming in. So I want to thank everybody again for the opportunity to visit with you tonight. Oh, wait, here's something. I'm a naturalist at Lake Houston Wilderness Park. Good for you. Um, so what I would do is um, to push the event to the public, email me and I will mail you a flyer, a, a couple of flyers that you can go ahead and use to promote the event, um, to hang them at your nature center uh, or wilderness park. Um, and then you can upload them to your Facebook or your other um, uh, 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 sites like, you know, Instagram or whatever you happen to use to promote it. So that's what I would encourage you to do. So again, send me an email and I'll share that information with you, Cecilia. Oh, my email. It is, let me type it in here. It is Craig Hensley at wd.texas.gov. There's my email right there for you. And I, I, I actually have no programs tomorrow. So Cecilia, if you email me that right away, I'll get it to you. Thank you for uh, posting that link for uh, the video, Rich. All right, folks. Well, I'm going to let you all go. Um, and I want to thank you again for the opportunity. Again, email me if you have more questions or, or get into a bind with something on iNaturalist and I'll try to help you through it all.